Right, full screen. Okay, so John will tell us about cutoffs and gravity. So please take it away. Okay, so thanks for the invitation. This this work is um, something that is sort of a side project for me. Both the one little paper about the use of cutoffs, and then since that didn't doesn't quite make up a um, full seminar, I'm throwing in some related work on asymptotic safety. Both of these are just attempts on my part to try to understand what's going on, what, what other people are doing. Um, my, my own research interest is trying to look at uh, the quantum field theory of quadratic gravity, trying to see unitarity, causality, stability there to see if this could be a um, viable quantum theory of gravity. And I think the results are encouraging, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm like, I'll just do this cutoff stuff. Um, and I do want to tell you the notationally the that I used lambdas in two senses. It's unfortunate, but that's what I do. The lambda with no subscripts is the cutoff. Lambda with a CC is the cosmological constant or the vacuum energy. That's my normalization for that. Um, I also don't want to pretend I'm advocating for using cutoffs here. I personally only use dimensional regularization in when I do effective field theory or even quadratic gravity um, because that respects the symmetries. And <coughs> cutoffs really don't. I mean, you know, cutoff, if you put a momentum cutoff, what are the units that you're using for your momentum? Um, and if you rescale your momentum, do you have to rescale your cutoff? So it's, it's a, sometimes a little bit of a puzzle to understand what a cutoff means, especially in gravity. But nevertheless, I mean, we do use cutoffs. We think of using cutoffs. When we do the standard model, um, you know, our core theory, we have a um, Lagrangian, and we say this Lagrangian is valid up to some scale, some cutoff scale. And we think using a cutoff there. And also, as you'll see later on, people in gravity actually do use cutoffs in describing running coupling constants. Uh, while I'll criticize that, it's practice and that's something we should understand. And I, also, I will, however, do a plug for uh, one case where I think cutoffs are a good thing to do, at least in effective field theories that are not gravitational. Um, the trouble with dimensional regularization in effective field theory is that it doesn't show decoupling as you approach the border of your effective field theory. If, you, if, you're, if you're back here and you're doing an effective field theory for gravity, in some sense, the coefficients uh, for the higher orders versus lowest orders is one way of describing the limits of the effective field theory. But if you're doing loops, you don't really see those coefficients. For example, in Carroll perturbation theory, there are these non-analytic mass dependencies, m squared log m squared or m to the cube, that cannot be mimicked by any in the uh, chiral coefficients. They're full rigorous predictions of chiral perturbation theory. But as you increase the mass, you're eventually going to go past the border where the effective field theory is not good. And so those, those non-analytic dependencies are wrong at some stage. They should decouple. They should, you should eventually have them fall. The loop effects fall off as a fact of power of mass and dimensional regularization doesn't do that. <coughs> if you apply a cutoff, you can see that. Um, and so at one stage in my life, I did this um, in, in baryon chiral perturbation theory. Uh, if you apply a cutoff, you can see what portions of the loops come from below the cutoff versus dimensional re regularization giving effects beyond the cutoff. And some of the results are dramatic. So you see here, the, the, these are cutoff regulated lines below a loop diagram that in dimensional regularization grows like m cubed, in fact, starts decoupling. And the effects are quite modest compared to the 
the dementia regularization one, saying that that was actually not a good prediction of the effect of field theory. Likewise, m squared log m squared. So the KMS is right around there. Um, in barrier and chiral perturbation theory, this is the m squared log m squared effect. This is the cutoff piece. The decoupling starts, whereas the dimensional regularization doesn't. Okay. So there are times when it's actually useful to use cutoffs. And so it's good to understand how you build in the symmetries of the theory at the least. So that's my digression into cutoffs in general, but let's look at the zero point energy in particular. This is, we've all either taught the story or seen it given as the introduction of talks. You commonly um, note that when you do canonical quantization that you get a zero point energy density, zero point energy, um, which is a half h bar omega per mode, which when summed over mode goes like lambda to the fourth. Um, and you say, well, we just subtract that off. It's just a zero point of energy. And then the common phrase is, well, but, but in fact, gravity cares. This is a contribution of the cosmological constant. The worst prediction ever, because it, if you take this cut off to the Planck scale, it looks like 10 to the 120 times it's the experimental value. That, that storyline, which we, I think we've all heard, isn't actually a reliable field theory statement because canonical quantization actually doesn't really have a good definition of the cosmological constant. If you quantize the whole energy momentum tensor, you get something whose lambda the force piece is traceless. And another definition of the cosmological constant is the trace of the energy momentum tensor either the vacuum energy or the trace, those are equivalent in a invariant, Lorentz invariant description, but the um, canal quantization gives you a, a divergences that can't be changed by any counter terms in a co covariant field theory. So it's a bit ambiguous what the real um, answer is. But you can actually get around that by just using quantum field theory without quantum canonical quantization. Use covariant quantum field theory. Excuse um, me. Excuse me, may I interrupt you, John? Sure. I think that just cutoffs of the power-like type, they just uh, parameterize our ignorance. And no matter what we do, it's the ignorance of what happens at UV where the cutoff, where the low energy theory ceases to be valid. And no matter how you parameterize it, cutoff at low energy theories, there is ambiguity at, at high energies at the extreme UV cannot be resolved unless you know physics at, at the UV. It's like with the pion theory, you know. Yeah, like I, I, I don't disagree with that statement. My whatever, whatever happens below the raw mass and mass with the pions, you can calculate or at least have an idea at energies or momenta above the raw mass and mass, the low energy pion theory can be thrown away because a totally different physics come into the play. And if you didn't know this physics, you would never be able to guess an answer, an answer from the pion theory, low energy pion theory, right? Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that, but I, I, what I, my point is going to be that if we're gonna think using cutoffs, we should at least get the calculations correct. And so I'm, I'm gonna point out a, a flaw in our usual way of calculating and it has implications for for the field in particular the you'll see an application to asymptotic safety yeah but you've mentioned this this worst worst prediction ladder it's not a prediction i die I mean, when I, people say I, that's worst prediction which contradicts the nature it's 
has nothing to do with the prediction. It just tells us that our ignorance of what happens at the extreme UV is the worst ignorance ever. And this formulation, with this formulation, I will be, be in agreement. But uh, saying that our prediction is 120 of orders of magnitude larger than experimental number, it's nonsensical. It's not a prediction. I, I was only doing sociology there, Misha. Um, I, was, I was saying what I hear all the time in, in talks. Um, I actually don't say that myself. I never have ever said that. I'm just doing sociology. This is what we say. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm gonna is, I'm this, gonna say that, that even that calculation is wrong. Yeah. So well, it, whatever you see, if people repeat one and the same wrong statements many times, doesn't mean that the statement becomes correct, right? It I think means I was that being, are, are being enough. I'm being cautious. I think if you listen to my words, I was saying we've heard this story many times. Yes. I'm gonna go against that story. So Okay, okay, I'm, okay. I'm sorry for interrupting you. Okay. Anyhow, let me just try to first see how one would actually do this calculation. Because I'm also going to say that even this field theory calculation is, is incorrect. Um, the, the way that you do the calculation is you hook, couple up your fields to gravity if you're trying to get the cosmological constant. That's a term in the gravitational action that has no derivatives on the fields. It's just a constant field. When you couple up the fields to matter, you couple with the energy momentum tensor, you calculate in field theory, you get a, you then will get a covariant result and you'll get a lambda to the fourth divergence if you naively cut off the momentum interval. Okay, so this is, this is a, a better way than, than the old zero point energy argument from canonical quantization gives a covariant answer. But I'll also say that that's wrong. That's, that's the, the point of this first part of the talk is that that calculation is missing something. And it's an interesting exercise in field theory to see what it, it is. The, the point is that the, um, this comes from the scaleless integral, d4p with, with no factors of momentum there. Now, normally you have to have at least a propagator, but to get rid of the propagator, you have to have derivative interactions. So numerator effects like p squared. So you get that integral only when the interactions involve two derivatives of the fields. But if you have two derivatives of fields, you, we will see that the interaction Lagrangian is changed. You have new, a new piece to the Feynman rules. The new piece cancels that off. Um, and the calculation I just did is not correct. The, I think the net result, I don't, this is not a mathematician speaking, but I think if you integrate over all the work that's been done on this type of thing, it's, you can make the claim that that scaleless integral with no momentum factors doesn't appear in quantum field theory. I'm not making that claim. I have a question mark there, but that's, I think, I think it could be made mathematically. Anyhow, the, this work goes back to work that I learned from the paper by Gerstein, Jakiv, Lee, and Weinberg, and my presentation is very influenced by that. Um, the, the, it was an, another paper at the same time, Honer, Kampf, and Meats, on the same thing in chiral theories. Chiral theories have the same feature here that they have derivative interactions. And when you do loops with cutoffs, you have to take that into account. Their work goes back to earlier work. It always traces back to De DeWitt eventually, um, but with nice papers by Salam Strati and Boulware along the way. When I wrote my paper, I didn't know that there was also an early work by Fratkin and Vilkovsky. Um, 
where they 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 do this the what I'm gonna give as a measure. They have they have it there. You're gonna see this delta four of zero. They do it for the gravitational field. Um, I this was brought to my attention by Setlin. Uh, I will we'll have a revised paper properly crediting this. I mean, technically there are a few things that I do um, that I treat that they don't treat, but morally they they had a bunch of the idea. John and Cherub came up with all that this. I have. I'm sorry? Uh, the gerstein jakeef lee weinberg paper was motivated by some work that John Sharap was doing. That's right. Right. Though it was in some sense correcting the, the work and explaining why, why these new rules are needed. Right. Yes. No, I, I'm aware of the history. I, you know, I, as I said, I learned this back in my chiral days when I was doing chiral perturbation theory myself partially by making the mistake of not knowing that paper and then um, doing something wrong and being corrected by Howard George. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so I had to, had to learn this from my own work back then. Anyhow, um, I'm not gonna use this, the, the, the most formal techniques. I'm gonna try to do it as simple as I can um, one of the simplifications is to try to bypass all of the obscurities of quantum field theory and curved space time by using first a simplified metric where I can do all the things I need to do as a usual Minkowski quantum field theory and, and not have to worry about the fact that I'm working in curved space time. And that's one where, where I just have a conformal factor in front of the uh, Minkowski metric that takes a generally covariant Lagrangian into the form just one plus H times the kinetic energy. I'm dropping masses for the moment. And so this looks, if I was just presented, this looks like I have two fields, phi and H, and I'm, I've got a derivative interaction between them. I can just calculate the renormalizations properties of that by itself. If you do that, you can identify the cosmological constant from the scalar curvature just by derivative factors. The cosmological constant doesn't involve any derivatives. The scalar curvature does. Um, and you can separate out those two pretty well. You can't separate out things that are orders of curvature squared because there is, in general, two relevant invariants. But this is a conf it's conformally flat. So I mean, it's, it's a conformal metric. So um, it, it only can pick out one of the two combinations. The other one, proportional to the vial tensor, can't be seen. But anyhow, but it does, it does my job here. I, I can pick out cosmological constant versus scalar curvature in renormalization. And here's, here's what happens. Um, this is just the summary. I'll, I'll do a little bit of the derivation in the next slide. Basically, what, what goes wrong right at the start is that the canonical momentum picks up a term due to the interaction. After massaging a little bit, you get an extra term in the interaction Hamiltonian um, which comes from this, this derivative interaction and the fact that the moment, canonical momentum is not just phi dot. Um, in addition, there are changes in the propagators. The interesting one is the last one, one with two derivatives there. Um, if you convert that to momentum space, picks up an extra piece in there that comes from the commutation rules of phi and phi and pi by phi dot. Um, here's, you know, this is not this is not me. This is Gerstein, Jacob, Lee, and Weinberg, um, and this is their notation, but it's it's basically carries through. Um, you basically 
your canonical momentum is is shifted just like the other one was the you decompose it into an interaction hamiltonian and a and a free hamiltonian free hamiltonian having the usual terms to do that then besides the interaction lagrangian you get a new piece there um the interaction lagrangian is written uh as usual you go to the interaction picture where Actually, that should be a, yeah, so the field goes to phi and the canonical momentum goes to d0 phi. And then you get this interaction picture Hamilton, the one I quoted before. I've just say for the, to doing this part, I just take theirs and I just make a notation change. Okay. Um, but then if I use that, I see that there are new new pieces that happen in a calculation. If I'm trying to calculate the effect on the linear in H, so I'm going to do a scalar particle loop and I'm calculating the, the term proportional to H. The, the, I get the, the linear tadpole there, uh, but I get a new piece here. This new piece comes from the propagators. So go back to the propagators. There's an extra piece in the propagator. Um, and I get a new piece from that. That integral, which normally would have been my scaleless integral, now vanishes because of that new term. At next order, I get several changes. I get from the bubble diagram, I get changes. I get the usual piece is the first piece there. The, these two are changes from the propagator, but then there's that new interaction that also comes in. And the, this is the effect of the new interactions. I add those up and I get an effect that also vanishes the lambda, the fourth piece vanishes and all the residual effects there are proportional to momentum which are then derivative effects. So they generate the um, renormalization of the, the scalar curvature. So these, this is, has uh, killed those lambda to the fourth terms that I was talking about before. They just aren't there in the calculation. Excuse me. John? All, yeah? all these integrals which you, uh, you combine, you know, in, in a, just as uh, they are regular integrals. None of them is well defined, of course. S separately, separately. If you take each integral separately. Yes, if you, yes, if you did, but I'm, uh, uh, let me combine them first. Um, I think it's fair to, fair to do that, to combine them at first. Uh, I have a question. If if you introduce a mass uh, it is infrared parameter to the scalar field, do you get uh, a mass to the four contribution to the lambda? That, well, no, and from this one, you, you don't, this particular one, you don't get mass to the fourth, but um, you get mass squared lambda squared. I'll come back to mass if you, if you don't mind, I'm going to add that later. Okay. Um, hey John, I also have a question. Sure. So normally when, when terms disappear, it's due to a symmetry, but here obviously there's no symmetry, right? You're getting this cancellation just because of this modified propagator, right? Yeah, yeah. In some ways, I think it's a residual of scale symmetry. So the original Lagrangian is in fact scale invariant. Um, there is no so, scale. I see, so that's why, so you're saying that there would be a symmetry argument here, basically that I, there's yeah, no so scale. So I, I do feel it's a symmetry argument. Certainly when you do it in chiral theories, it's a very explicit symmetry argument. Scale symmetry is a little bit less obvious because, well, of course there's anomalies, but right. they, they don't play a role here. Um, but I, so it's, it, if you want to phrase it as a symmetry argument, it's, it's, it's scale symmetry. Okay, thanks. Okay. In fact, I didn't have to do the calculation to get that result. Here's an easy derivation. 
And this, but this also tells me a bit about the physics. Um, if you look at the Lagrangian that I started with, this was an overall factor. If that factor H had been a constant, we would know what would have happened here. That if that's just a constant, then we would absorb it into the, renorm the normalization of the field and it would disappear. There would be no effect. The, the fact that it's not a constant means its derivatives can play a role, but any constant value of H should not. We can do that mathematically by doing a field redefinition. If I just pretend I'm doing this wave function renormalization as if this was a constant, but I keep the derivatives factors, I, I turns into a Lagrangian that only involves derivatives of H and not H itself. So in particular, you either get the form above there or after an integration of a part, you get this form where in these units, that's the square root, fourth root of G times R. Now, there are no unusual quantization rules. The canonical momentum is the same as usual. This is just a usual interaction with the field being fourth root of GR. There's and, no way for this to ever give you. And one six, this is a regular sort of one six. usual one six, yeah. Uh, the, in the sc showing scaling symmetry, right? Exactly. That's, that's why it's, I mean, Yes, you could you you could have guessed that one because it's really just a rescaling of the of the field. Um, so, if I just had done this at the start, I could already have known that there was no contribution. So, now, how would this play out in covariant quantization? Now, the so if you go to the Weinberg Lagrangian to keep Lee Weinberg um, paper, they go through a very awkward derivation um, where they do the, the Hamiltonian path integral and they convert to the Lagrangian path integral. Um, and the, it comes up with the same answer that I'm about to come up with. The paper by Gerstein and Meats does it this way. Basically, if you can find a a field definition which doesn't have any problems with the this new interaction like I've just done, you can transform back to the original field by, a, by this wave function redefinition. And in covariant quantization, what you do is you pick up a Jacobian. The Jacobian is just the, related to the derivatives of the field, two definitions of the fields and then you you can you can exponentiate that. Um, in our case, the the do, normally if this is non-local, you get your ghost fields. But this is local; it's a it's a lo local in position space, and it's just this becomes the square root of one plus h. The the new interaction then is is e to the delta of zero log one plus the square root of h. Okay. So if, you're, if you go back to your original variables in the covariant quantization, you can use this, you can use the usual rules if you also include this new interaction. And this then has the effect that it claims. Um, with this interaction, you just calculate away but there's a new piece and from that delta four of zero, you get the scaleless integral, which gives you exactly the right coefficient to cancel off the um, piece that you found in canonical quantization. Okay, so the, the conclusion of this pathway is that you, there's a new interaction that's required, comes from the measure in the path integral, and it has this 
this form of canceling off the most divergent pieces. Okay, here's another way of looking at it. This is now with a more general metric. Um, and I have one more way to show you how it cancels things off rather than just doing Feynman diagrams. Um, if I, I can take any metric at all. So now that it's not a restricted, I can write it as a conformal factor in a, in a residual piece that's unimodular. So its determinant is minus one. And then therefore the unimodular piece cannot contribute to the cosmological constant. It's only the conformal factor that does in, in, when I write it this way. The correspondence that we have is this one plus h is, is omega squared. Um, and if you just follow through the new interaction is then um, log, log of omega or log of the determinant of g with uh, one eighth factor there. If you use this in um, path integral, you can, I will show you down at the bottom here that this leads to the same cancellation. Let's see how it goes. I mean, basically if you take the action, there's the omega squared factor that sits in front and then the rest is formed using the, the metric, the unimodular metric. If I integrate by parts, I get d squared, which has the unimodular part and also derivatives, but, but no constant factor. So the, all the constant factors sit outside. I now do the path integral. I have the integral over a usual piece, but with this factor. I get one over determinant omega squared d squared, determinant omega out in front. The overall constant factors cancel off and I'm left over only with derivative interactions. So this is how just doing the path integral does this local wave function renormalization. It achieves the independence of this overall factor in the front. Okay. Any questions on that one? Yeah, so, so basically you're saying that th this term is just scale invariant and even that's true even at the quantum level it's, and yeah. any, any scale anomaly will not contribute to the cosmological constant. That's, oh, but they're just throwing they're, they're just, the anomaly. scale anomalies can, but their logarithmic contributions are not mass to the fourth. It right. was a free field theory, no interaction. You that's add right. lambda phi to the fourth and everything will be ruined. Yeah, so, so the anomaly it, indeed will appear. Yes, right, interactions right. Are, yeah. well, interactions are different, but I'm, I'm getting rid of this one term at a time. Okay. Um, if if I do this for other fields, I'm not going to do that because it's boring. But I, I the paper has this for fermions, for photons. Um, I will say just a moment on gravitons, just because I'm going to do asymptotic safety where gravitons. It works for gravitons also. Um, you can do that here using a background field method, which is also what asymptotic safety folks do. Um, if by factoring out the overall factors and the kinetic energy pieces, you go through the same sort of analysis and get a, a new interaction that cancels off the um, the quartic divergences. I, there's no point in really doing this for everybody, every field, but it works for, for all the fields. Um, in the case of fermions, it works even when you have only one extra derivative. Um, for bosonic fields, you need two to have this extra term. Okay. Um, I was asked about masses. Masses upset my argument here. So what I showed above is that the scalar integral, this guy doesn't contribute. Um, the, you might ask about a scaleless integral like that. I would love to have a way to argue that that's unphysical. I don't have any mathematics to back that up. Um, all the calculations that I've done there show that there are effects like that. If I, for example, 
do the rescaling, but do it with a mass term, then the I get derivative interactions, except for the masses have a residual effect. It's easy to calculate. You get a lambda if you if you chose to do cutoffs. Again, I'm not advocating that you do, but if you chose, you would get an effect it goes like the fourth root of G and and it looks like a cosmological constant almost, except for that guy I'll come back to. Likewise, you saw the Einstein term in the previous action. Um, if I include loops here, I just have a propagator, a single propagator. I get one over P to the fourth. I also get quite quadratic cutoff dependence. I, um, I don't see an argument that that's unphysical, even though it does go against my scale invariance. Um, these oh, are both, okay. These are both effects that disturb the scale invariance, either the mass or background curvature. But, but that's what I have. Okay, so why do we care? Well, I don't. I don't know what we. If we really care, I mean, we can. We. I've removed the piece, which it doesn't exist in dimensional regularization. But we, t we tend to think about it, um, this cutoff as if it was there. For example, the usual zero point energy, one of, again, one of the arguments, not that I've made, but which I have heard and believed for a long time, was that, that since we have this, um, dramatic dependence, we need to have a mechanism to cancel it. It's not obvious you do, but if, if you want to, you would cancel it by having equal numbers of bosons and fermion de degrees of freedom since they contribute equally and opposite to this and that. It's a motivation then for supersymmetry. We don't need that motivation and the, the, at the, at if this mechanism removes that problem. Excuse me. So far, you didn't consider scale anomalies. Mass terms indeed will violate the scale anomalies softly, and therefore lambda to the fourth term will cancel automatically. It will be m squared lambda squared. But if you consider the effects of the scale anomalies, which are by themselves not proportional to any of the masses, mass of the particle, this will give rise to lambda to the fourth. Take QCD or even, even uh, lambda phi four. The theory lambda phi four already has a scale anomaly. And it is proportional, the scale anomaly in uh, trace of the energy momentum tensor is proportional to phi four, dimension four operator. So naively, it will lead to lambda to the fourth. And I emphasize naively because we still don't know what happens at the UV. But if you act naively, just counting the scaling dimensions, I would expect lambda to the fourth from the scale anomaly, even in the simplest scalar theory, let alone uh, gauge theory. Yeah. I, it, it, that may be the case. I, I actually can get lambda to the fourth from a, a different mechanism than, than you're saying, um, but again, with interactions. My, my main target is really that, that integral, the, the integral, the scaleless integral. I, that, that's my main target. I, in some sense, I don't care too much about No, that. no, so but sure. this integral you combine with this, excuse me, I don't, with your equation two lines below this integral. And then you say that lambda to the fourth cancel, but m squared lambda squared appears. That's because it's a very specific expression which depends on the scale symmetry breaking explicitly only by the mass term. Right. I'm saying that if you calculated, at least added it to this effective Lagrangian one loop, at one loop, there is a scale symmetry breaking through this uh, anomaly. An anomaly in this theory, which you consider, would be lambda to the fourth, not m squared, phi squared. Well, but I think actually, 
I think the lambda of the fourth be canceled off by this effect if you. No, it. it's a scale anomaly. No, it's no, not. No, you, you, get, you get the, you get, if you, let's say you're doing QCD, you, you get, you get QCD, log lambda times F squared. In QCD, it's Jimmy new squared, also dimension four operator, and it's not canceled. What can cancel it? It's the, you, you calculate theta mu mu. In your case, when you add the mass term, theta mu mu would be m squared phi squared. Correspondingly, when you calculate contribution to the vacuum energy, you get m squared lambda squared, just by dimension of, of the field phi. Right. If you have phi to the four on the right-hand side of the trace of the energy momentum, doing this integral, you immediately get back lambda to the fourth. So it's not explicit because mass term is a soft violation of breaking. So it doesn't, I mean, it appears being suppressed by itself squared or. or yeah, so I think I, I agree that uh, I don't have a spare page here, but, but the, if I did have lambda the fourth, I would have a diagram that looks like this. Yes. Which is, which is that diagram squared, which does give me a lambda the fourth. Lambda to the fourth. That's what if I. I, if I totally agree with that. I'm not say, saying that, but it's, I'm trying to get trying to get rid of the um, this piece by itself. Okay. Okay. It, it, I mean, in some sense, lambda to the fourth as an interaction is an optional effect. Self energies are the free field theory is not optional. So I'm. I don't dispute that there could be lambda to the fourth effects with interaction. It's, but I, I am trying to get rid of that integral. So maybe I should be clear about that. Um, I'm not convinced that we need to get rid of these things, but if you did want to, if you want to get rid of the quadratic dependence, you need uh, mass sum rule which is not satisfied with the usual particles. Anyway, let me not to do too much about this. Um, I did have just a, a quick comment on general covariance. From our direct calculation there, we actually saw things that were not covariant. When I did the mass effect, I got the fourth root of G. When I did the, the, um, scalar curvature, I got the fourth root of G sitting in front of it. Those are not covariant. So the, the theory that I was using there actually doesn't give covariant results for the, unless you modify the cutoff. I, I have no idea if that's, I don't think that's a general result, but it illustrates a, a problem which I think is general, which is that when using cutoffs, you, you don't, you may have to rescale your cutoffs and when I hear talks about transplanking effects, I often worry that the people are thinking of cutoffs without, without this, this type of modification. Anyway, here's my summary of, of this part, which is I'm, I'm in plenty good time shape. We have this new interaction, cancels off the effects of, of this, this particular scale is integral. It vanishes in dimensional organization, but if you're doing anything else, you need to know about this. The other, the place where people actually do this, which I'll argue now is, is doing something wrong, is in asymptotic safety. So let me spend, I have about 15 minutes, I guess, um, talking about asymptotic safety. Again, I'm not an advocate. I'm trying to understand what is going on when they do what they do. So Weinberg has defined asymptotic safety um, in the following way. He, he said, let's consider dimensionless couplings. So in this case of gravity, you would make couplings dimensionless by multiplying them by a scale factor. Um, you would then get reaction rates 
depending on what you're calculating, would have some overall factor of this, the scale factor, factors of energy over the scale factor. Um, and then the couplings could depend on this, do have to depend on the scale factor then. Um, if you think of them as renormalized couplings, you might try measuring them at some renormalization point. And then you, if you choose your renormalization point as the energy, you get these running couplings, these dimensionless running couplings governing your reaction rates. So the logic here is that much like in renormalizable field theories where you have dimensionless coupling constants and overall factors of energy, um, you'd get the same thing here, even in a more general theory. Um, if you use these dimensionless couplings and asymptotic safety is the idea that these, well, not necessarily vanishing, they go to UV fixed points where their beta functions vanish. Okay. The, um, in gravity, there is an infinite number of these couplings. So if you're gonna apply this to gravity, you're gonna have an infinite number. Um, at high energies, all these are active. But basically you define dimensionless ones, you defi defied by the scale factors to the fourth. Um, and G gets multiplied by scale factor squared. And then you look at the running of those. Weinberg's definition is actually not fully adequate and I'm not gonna spend much time on this, but reaction rates depend on more than one energy. They depend on um, multiple energies and those kinematic variables have different signs. Um, they're not all positive. Some of them like S is often positive, T is negative. Um, you don't want power law runnings where these coupling constants carry different signs in different directions that they run. But let's, let me not do that now. I come back to it later if I have time, which I may not. But asymptotic safety as it's operated as a, as a field does the following. It of course has to truncate the basis set. So there's some basis. They use an Euclidean infrared cutoff um, it's an infrared cutoff, so it removes the effects below the scale and keeps the, normally keeps them above. You then, it's a cutoff. Um, it, the renormalization group flow is calculated from d, d by d lambda of the cutoff. And so they want the cutoff to be smooth so they don't get delta function. So it's, it's not quite a, a step function, it's a smooth function. But basically you then iterate one loop running using this functional renormalization group. If you flow to the ultraviolet, they're supposed to flow to a fixed point. If you flow to the infrared, you should be in, therefore including no cutoff. So that's all the physics. So the cutoff equals to zero is all of the physics and the cutoff is infinity is, is no quantum effects. Um, if you flow all the way to, z to the cutoff to zero, then you supposedly get a special Lagrangian with fixed coefficients. Um, and the question is, what, what do you make of this flow? Now, Weinberg's definition clearly uses these running coupling constants as physical parameters in physical reactions. The question is, can you do that in asymptotic safety practice? I, I think the answer is that it, it, it's not. And here's, here's an example. This is a very brief example, but um, this is the one loop and doing just the Einstein-Hilbert truncation. It worked done by Cordello and Percacci in 2006. Um, if you do this truncation, they normally provide renormalization group equations for G and for G lambda. But it turns out if, if you 
use lambda, the cosmological constant, and one over G, the renormalization groups decouple. And this actually tells you what, what is going on. The, the renormalization group for the cosmological constant is lambda to the fourth. So we should get a flag there. And the, the running group for the Einstein action is um, lambda squared. So these are just the tadpoles that I, I described before. In fact, this calculation could, have, could be done using the gravitational action and the, just the, the tadpole loop that I gave before. And, yeah, if you look at the papers, it's fancier, but, but that's the net effect. The net result then is, is that their cosmological constant that should be as a function of lambda, sorry, um, runs from the experimental value to infinitely anti disitter space. The G runs as a constant to, to some fixed point. And you can see the fixed points because dimensionally you would divide lambda by lambda. The cosmological constant by lambda is a four, it's at one over G divided by one of lambda squared. So those are the fixed points there, the, the exhibit UV fixed points. But in terms of physical parameters, all you've done is, is that calculation, the tadpole calculation. So <clears throat> comments. I think the work that I did before did shows that the cosmological constant running is wrong. It didn't include the Jacobian effect, so they need to go back and include that. More to the point and more interesting to folks is probably that these are not running coupling constants as we know them, or as Weinberg meant them. There is no momentum flowing through that tadpole. These are just act ex external exert insertions and they would not give momentum dependence in any particular physical reaction. The lambda that you see there has nothing to do with the external momentum, which are the derivatives of the, the metric. Um, if you were to really calculate physics, you would include the quantum effects up to lambda. Lambda is just a place where you've part done an incomplete calculation. So you would include them up to lambda. Lambda disappears from observables. It's just renormalization theory. And I think the, the bottom line, which I think is correct, is that this is not the asymptotic safety that Weinberg defined. It doesn't give you running coupling constants in physical reactions. Um, Somewhat to my surprise, the people in asymptotic safety actually tended to agree with that, though they feel it's not as fatal as I do. Um, but these are quotes from the first one is a review paper and the other two are direct comments to me, um, that the running couplings they have are not directly observable nor even directly related to observables. I have no idea why that should work. Um, anyway, so this, the asymptotic safety needs to at least be redone with this taking into account the Jacobians. And in fact, generalizing it because they have higher order terms. Um, I have a little section here that says that the asymptotic safety style running as defined by Weinberg is not seen in nature below the Planck scale at least. Um, and the idea here is to try to define a running coupling constants which, which um, capture quantum effects. Looking at the time, I'm not gonna have a chance to go through this in great detail, but basically, basically what, here's what I, so you try to define our, uh, our running coupling constant in G. You do a bunch of calculations. You do graviton, graviton scattering. You try to pull out a, a running coupling 
you do scalar scattering, pull out a running coupling, you do um, different types of scalars, you do gravity matter, you do bending of light. You will see if you look through the formulas that I just flashed past that none of the effects are, are similar at all. They, they are all very different. They don't look like they're just a renormalization of G. And that they, that we wouldn't expect this to be the case because gravity loops don't renormalize G here. The renormalize higher order coefficients when you're doing these effective field theory calculations. Um, and so we're, we're really not doing renormalizing the original com constant. So my, the point here is, is basically that um, power law running doesn't work in Lorentzian amplitudes. And so I don't think that nature organizes itself the way asymptotic safety is predicting. Anyway, I rushed through that. I apologize, but basically I, I think the definition of Wein, that Weinberg gave is, is a bit inadequate, inadequ um, but fails in practice below the Planck scale. The present asymptotic safety practice fails um, and the running coupling constants that they that are done used in the field are not the running coupling constants as, as we know them. Anyway, I will stop there. Uh, Okay, thank you very much. Maybe we can virtually applaud John. Um, there's a button you can click there. Uh, if there are any questions. So John, so you're saying then that uh, in this asymptotic safety calculations, if they take into account your cancellation of the lambda to the fourth, then they won't find a fixed point anymore? The, if they take into account the, um, they won't find that lambda runs at all, even even I with their see. definition of running. I see. They will basically yeah. uh, that guy will be zero. I see. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because what about G then? Because that calculation has just been the self energy piece that I, I I've been working on. Well, you know I. And, and, and what about G interactions that could government. potentially generate this later on, but it's not what they're seeing at the moment. Okay. Can I ask you uh, more about the cosmological constant business? Yep. So I understood very well your point about the free fields and that the zero point energies are incorrect to be identifying with uh, with uh, lambda to the four correction to the lambda cc but uh, in light of what misha discussed as well with a more complicated interacting theory is this uh, this quartic sensitivity is this wrong at all or uh, um, whatever I would call it, like a cutoff or, or, you know, sensitivity to a new scale or not, right? I mean, like, because we know that there are scalar fields like Higgs fields and their self-interaction is one, one over eight, right? Lambda is not small, right? So, so if all this inclusion of this uh, non-trivial self-interactions would it resurrect this lambda to, to the four behavior or not? Yeah, so I, I think it's true. I mean, the, the picture that I drew here, maybe I should have built into the talk. Um, that's, that's from a lambda to the fourth interaction. Um, I think if you were a model builder and trying to avoid that, I mean, this is a five, I'm sorry, you're five to the fourth. This is lambda, different lambda, five to the fourth. Um, at two loops. Um, if you were trying to avoid that term, you would write, try to write a, a fundamental theory that didn't have that, but induced it. So, you know, some of these attempts to do conformal scalar mo standard models might be a good place. Conformal symmetry would have forbidden that to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, 
you can you can often induce things. I mean, for example, you can induce the cosmological constant from QCD. It's, um, it's not that it's a forbidden interaction that exists. And I, you know, I maybe the fact that lambda to the fourth could occur with this shouldn't bother people. In some ways, my my own takeaway from this is to is a classification of what things occur in field theory and what don't. And I my my takeaway is that that guy doesn't appear in field theory. Like it seems to cancel out in every situation that I know of. Um, and that has relevance to practice like asymptotic safety. Okay. And if if you did want to avoid this, if, if the lambda to the fourth interactions were ones that bothered you particularly, you would you would try to do model building to avoid them. Sure. Um, the, the figure eight diagram in perturbation theory would vanish if you work with the normal ordered Hamiltonian into the interaction yeah. picture. Yeah, and so the. the if you're doing canonical quantization, in some ways, the self-energy argument tells me that I should actually be working with a normal order of Hamiltonian to begin with, even, even at, at free field level. The, because that non-covariant ca canonical quantization of self-energy, just free field self-energy, with the non covariance there. Uh, there's no counter term removes that. So I, I think the only way to do that consistently is to start with a normal ordered um, free field Hamiltonian. It's, it's just not how we normally describe things. We just, we, but it means that some of these, these um, non normal ordered things may be spurious. Right, and, and the, the anomaly term that Misha was talking about is a five-fourth times the beta function. And presumably that would not give you a vacuum expectation value unless you are actually seeing it non-perturbatively. Right. It would not, I mean, just like in the QCD case. Yeah. Yeah, I somehow, I don't think that the anomalies are a problem here, but yeah. Okay, um, I'll pause recording now. So.